some more spirits. Oh, this is time to cut. What is this? Fans of Supernatural can rejoice because the Winchesters are back on the hunt. Sure, this time it isn't Sam and Dean, the monster fighting brothers, but that does not in the slightest take away from the spin-off at all. In fact, the show is actually staying very true to its roots and enormous fan base. This time we are following the story of Sam and Dean's parents, John and Mary. The Winchesters tell the untold love story of John and Mary and moreover, how they save the world together. Fair warning though, there's going to be some spoilers up ahead, so if you haven't watched the show already, please do so because it's fantastic, especially if you're a Supernatural fan. The nostalgia really hits hard when we really feel they did justice to the original show. But before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. So thank you, and let's begin. <laughs> From the original show, we know that John was a hunter who got his sons into hunting long ago. However, the show began with both the boys looking for their dad. Dean had kept up with the family business while Sam was living a quiet life, but one day his girlfriend was killed in the same way that their mother died back when they were babies. Later in the show, we find out that the whole thing was orchestrated by the demon general Azazel. This is exactly what got Sam back into business. Okay, so that was Supernatural. In the Winchesters, we find John Winchester fresh back from Vietnam. He was a soldier boy whose main job was scouting or finding people. He returns from war to a letter apparently addressed to him from his father. Also in one of the episodes, we could find out that the person who handed John the letter mysteriously disappeared pretty much instantly. Kind of foreboding, huh? Funny thing is that his father walked out on their family about 15 years ago. Apparently John never knew why he did this and was under the impression that neither did his mother. Irrespective, his mother is glad to have her son back after two years of him serving in the army, but be it as it may, John was ultimately driven to find his father more than anything else, even if that meant walking out on his mother. So he came back mainly to look for his dad. Mary Campbell at first seems like a very innocent girl who likes making art. However, we very soon discover that she's actually a seasoned hunter. Hunting for her has been a family business since as long as she can remember, so when her father went missing, on a hunt alone, she felt things were a little off. This was mainly because, up until his disappearance, the family had always hunted together like a team. This gave Mary the idea that her father was onto something bigger or hiding something even. Where is my father? Oh, Daddy's missing. She didn't care much for why he did what he did, just as long as she could find him. Another fact to note is that her cousin Maggie had passed away on a hunt the previous year. This had really hit Mary hard because they were very close, almost like real sister. So the thought of possibly losing another family member was just a big no for her. Mary also made it clear that she wanted to retire from hunting after she found her dad. All right, we're pretty sure you're noticing the trend over here. It seems the world of Supernatural runs around children chasing their parents. Now let's get into the story of how this hunter couple even came to be in the first place. So in the pilot, we see John Winchester came back from the war. On the bus ride home, we discover that he has severe PTSD from the war and often has flashbacks. Walking towards what we can only guess is his mother's garage, he bumps into a blonde girl outside of a movie theater. Quite cliche, yes, but hey, we love it anyway. They have a small interaction with a hint of flirting in there, and we know instantly that at least John is quite interested in her. She leaves after giving him a box of licorice drops, which he hasn't had any of since going to the war. They never exchange names, though. Instead, she just calls him Soldier Boy as she goes off after picking up her things. Later, John arrives at his mother's garage and they have a very nice reunion. And soon enough, we find out that John had actually enlisted while he was underage, having forged his father's signature on a waiver. So just imagine his mom's surprise after seeing him drink a beer when the last time she saw him he was maybe 17. Later that night, John goes in search of an address mentioned in his letter. As soon as he finds it, he is encountered by a demon who, like the nasty cretins they are, threaten him to hand over the key to the building or die a gruesome death. John obviously doesn't know that this person is a demon until he tries punching him only to discover that he has no impact at all. Also, this man's eyes turn pitch black. This is when Mary steps in and starts fighting the demon. This bit is kind of hilarious because John tries to help Mary fight the demon but ends up hitting Mary in the face every time until she literally asks him to stop helping. Stop helping! 
Like a good veteran hunter, Mary has come prepared and has a giant tub of holy water set right there. She pushes the demon into the tub and starts reciting an exorcism. As soon as she finishes, black smoke shoots out of the demon's mouth and goes into the night sky. This is John's first interaction with the supernatural world of monsters. Mary then explains to him that yes, it's all real, demons, monsters, and even magic. Turns out that the building John was looking for was the same one that Mary wanted to get into. She even had a demon trap ready in the front of the door. John tells her everything about his father and that the letter that he got, while Mary tells him about her father also who went missing recently and that this is where her search had led her so far. John manages to convince Mary to let him stick around and enter the building with her so that they could both get their answers. As John opens the door with the key from his letter, Mary notices a talisman hanging from it and is surprised. The talisman is for preventing a demon from possessing you. This increases Mary's intrigue quite a bit, and once they get in, they discover that this was the clubhouse for the Men of Letters. At the time, Mary had no idea about who they were, but she knew that she needed to get a file from them relating to a box of some sort. John finds his father's locker with the initials H-E-W for Henry Eric Winchester. Obviously, the combination for the lock is John's birthday. John opens the locker to find a bunch of his father's belongings, including a pair of spectacles, a watch, and a journal, all of which he takes with him. Mary takes her file, and they both leave the building. As their night comes to an end, Mary finally reveals her name to John, and this is just one of the moments which make you start rooting for them together as a team. They are pretty darn cute. I'm Mary. It's nice to officially meet you, Mary. John stays quite adamant and stubborn about Mary and him looking for their fathers together, especially because it is possible that their fathers knew each other and were both men of letters. So she knows fully well the dangers this job brings with it. She tries very hard to keep John out of it because she doesn't want to lose anyone else anymore. This is well backed by the fact that she wants to quit hunting for good when she finds her father. But anyway, John stays persistent and Mary finally caves. They begin their search together for this mysterious box. Here we are introduced to Latika, the bookworm and pacifist who acts as the researcher for Mary and is a hunter in training herself. John is the one who comes up with the next lead, by the way, taking Mary a bit by surprise. Adam Monroe has gone missing. She owned a bookstore and apparently was the first person that Mary's dad went to looking for a book on goals. So the connection was pretty self-explanatory. Find Ada, get news about Mary's father Samuel, while John and Mary went to Ada's bookstore to check out the crime scene for any clues that would lead them to her. But they get attacked by another demon. Oh, and right before that, John asks about a weird smell in the store. And if you know you're supernatural, you should know that it's the smell of sulfur. Demons always leave sulfur where they go. Anyway, this demon shows up and wrecks Mary's car, which by the way, is a beautiful example of an American muscle car and really pays homage to Sam and Dean's car from Supernatural. Right then, out of nowhere, a van swerves in and slams into the demon, knocking it over. Long hair hippie Carlos exits the van and hands John a piece of paper and asks him to recite the incantation to exorcise the demon. What is this? After exercising it, we see that the team is really coming together. Mary, John, Carlos, and Latika then go to try to discover more about the strange box as well as the whereabouts of Ada. Latika finds out that the box was an invention made by the Men of Letters that can destroy any monster by sucking it in. Their search leads them to a cemetery, the same one we see in the pilot. Here they find a crypt with the Men of Letters symbol on top. Mary finds her father's lighter and is relieved that they're on the right track. Weirdly enough, there's also a super deep hole in the ground that leads to a giant cave system under the graveyard. Mary and John go down and start looking for the box. Later on, we see that Carlos recognizes some of the symbols inside the crypt while he was standing guard. Turns out, the Men of Letters kept a monster inside the cave to act as a guard dog to prevent anyone from trying to steal the box. John and Mary do find the box, however, the Lucarou, aka the Watchdog, finds them too. They run and hide because they don't have any silver to fight with it. John has the brilliant and utterly reckless idea of using a piece of silver shrapnel that was lodged in his forearm to try to fend off the beast long enough for Mary to escape with the box. 
Stupid as it was, it worked, and Mary managed to escape. But meanwhile, Carlos and Latika are attacked by a demon-possessed Ada. Mary shows up just in time and throws the box to Lada, who manages to open it, and the demon's soul gets sucked out of Ada and trapped in the box and thus presumably dead. Mary throws a silver machete down the hole, which John uses to cut the head off the watchdog monster. Ada then explains to the gang that the box is the only item that can defeat the Akrita, otherworldly monsters that are trying to take the earth for themselves. Samuel was looking for the box to stop an invasion because the men of letters were gone and no longer able to stop them. John decides to take up hunting since that's what his father did, so he goes to Savannah with the band of misfits in search of a new clue. According to Dean Winchester, who is recounting these events as a narrator, the Akrita pose a threat to not just our world, but to all of reality and everything in existence, which is why he plans to keep looking for further details about this untold part of his parents' lives. And yes, hearing Dean's voice again after so long was so nostalgic, the feeling quite surreal. In the savannah, the gang finds out that the files on the Akrita are missing. However, there were signs of Samuel having been there and active. They find a recent fight scene with a bunch of dead monsters along with a newspaper clipping stuck to one of the bodies leading them to a missing persons report in Topeka. Ada, you set up shop in the clubhouse and dig into fixing this box. The rest of us will talk to this kid's dad and see what's going on. Upon returning home, John clashes with his mother over hunting and storms off straight to the next case. Children from a hippie commune in Topeka have started to vanish after being captured by a shape-shifting monster. Mary fights with the others as a result of her urgency to solve the case and resume the search for Samuel. She makes a hasty decision as to what the monsters are that they're dealing with and without collecting all the evidence and jumps to a conclusion. Her blindness puts John in danger when the monster takes the appearance of his mother and kidnaps him. Latika, feeling that something was off about their investigation, recognizes that the monsters they're dealing with is Latunda. This was a monster version of an abusive mother that eats disobedient kids. They find Latunda's hiding place, save her captives, and then use a broken shard of her own wooden leg to murder her. Back in their hideout, Ada looks into the memories of the demon that had possessed her via a potion and automatic writing and tries to find some information about the other demon the gang had battled in the expectations that it would have data from the Akrita and the box. After closing the case in Topeka, John makes amends with his mother. Later in the night, long after the gang has left Topeka, a horde of Akrita follows the Akrita leader as it enters Latunda's den, takes some of her essence, and leaves. While Ada and Carlos look for Slick, the accomplice of the demon that had taken possession of Ada, Mary's neighbor Carrie, is kidnapped, sending her on a quest with Mary, John, and Leda. Slick adds that he and his companion struck a deal to exchange the box for their lives because they believed that they couldn't stop the Akrita even with it. Hell wasn't an option for them either because they were cast out. But other than the fact that the Akrita commander has gotten itself a human vessel, he has no knowledge of the Akrita or how the box itself functions. Ada magically imprisons the demon in a bonsai tree instead of casting it out. After Carrie's brother Ford is also kidnapped, it is pretty much confirmed that Borababa, an Indian boogeyman who tempts people with objects that hold special meaning to them, is to blame. While well, Latika learns from some relatives of hers that the victims must destroy or let go of the items that they were baited by in order to get out of there, Mary enters Boribaba's bag to save the kids. Mary is forced to confront her worries about life after hunting when John tells her this over a CB radio. She is unable to reconcile with the fact that there can even be a life after hunting for her when that's all that she knows. John slashes the monster's head off when it pursues them outside. While Mary has a casual date in the movies, John is reunited with Beatty and reconciles the relationship. The group is concerned about the consequences of the emergence of La Tunda and Boribaba, two uncommon monsters from other civilizations. An Akrita carries Boribaba's bag to the group's leader, who absorbs a potion of the monster's essence like she did with Latunda. They later discover that the local DJ Rockin' Roxy is in possession of the Akrita leader. It is at the end of the Boribaba episode when we find out that Betty and John were actually engaged before he went to war. 
a therapy group that Patches, a World War II veteran, had been part of, is joined by John and Carlos after the monster gang looks into the veteran's death, who was discovered to have been part of the Navy Corps. Mary finds out that there have been several similar veteran facilities across the nation from her movie date, who is apparently a journalist named Kyle. The case pushes Mary and Lana to face their sadness over the loss of Mary's cousin Maggie, while John and Carlos are forced to face their trauma from the Vietnam War. Mars Nito, a Celtiberian god who pretended to be one of the gang members, is revealed to be the culprit. Mars divulges that a conflict with the Akrita is imminent and that he thinks John, who is both a soldier and a hunter, might be honed into a potent weapon to vanquish them. Mars's Amphoria is found and destroyed by Mary, Lata, and Millie as John battles Mars, making him vulnerable and enabling John to kill him. The dying Mars, however, informs John that he is now prepared for the conflict with the Akrita. Following the incident, Mary purges Maggie's old room, Carlos keeps going to therapy, and John sobs while Millie holds him. The four-member gang looks into a string of bizarre fatalities that they think may have been caused by a djinn. The monster hunters run into Tony, a demi-djinn of sorts. He happens to be Ada's long-lost son from her relationship with a djinn named Ali. It is believed, at least initially, that Ali was killed by hunters. Tony, however, blames that it was in fact the Akrita that are to blame, having given the victims a mind-control toxin that ended up being lethal to them. Mary receives the toxin injection while defending the Akrita's subsequent victim. In order to assist John in entering Mary's head and confront the trauma of the time when her parents broke the news to a five-year-old Mary that she would grow up to be a hunter, Ada persuades Tony to use his dreamwalking abilities. This will enable Mary to destroy the Akrita stingers. After Tony explains that they are gathering the essence of rare monsters, a group concludes that the victims are all linked with a broadcasting tower project that the Akrita have been using to transmit signals to lure a exotic beasts. They identified Rock and Roxy as the Akrita chief based on project documents. Roxy is informed by another Akrita that Mary has eluded their grasp, but she is unconcerned since she is confident that the Akrita will finally succeed in controlling the hunters as they see fit. John feels romantically interested in Mary during these events, but he decides not to express them in favor of pushing her to achieve her desire of leaving the town to start a new life when she is finally done with hunting. This is just the beginning for the power couple as they keep going on adventures to follow and track down Mary's father. The show and its structure is very similar to Supernatural, whether it's the music, the atmosphere, or the characters. It really has stayed true to what the original show meant, and as long-standing fans, we can definitely appreciate that. If you notice, even in the intro cut where they show the name of the show, we're pretty sure that they use the same sound as was used in Supernatural. Classic rock hits from the 70s are also heard in including Carry Onward Sons by Kansas, which was basically the theme song for Supernatural, it's also very interesting to see how they weave the plot of this show perfectly into the plot lines of Supernatural. In the original show, the Men of Letters were introduced in the 8th season. We find out that Henry was the Man of Letters when he suddenly showed up in 2013 in front of Sam and Dean. This is one hell of a show and caters not only to Supernatural fans, but anyone who would enjoy dark fantasy and horror. The pace of the show, the development of characters, and even the music are just really well done. The dramatic side of it and the fact that everyone in the show has a part that we can relate to, whether good or bad, really glues you in. Jensen and Daniel Ackles are the executive producers. We do see Jensen reprising his role as Dean, although he doesn't really get much screen time at all. More episodes are yet to come, so go find out how the Winchesters save their love and the world. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. And in the meantime, have a good one and be safe. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for being there with me, John. Yeah. Anytime.